Is there anybody, anybody out, there? out there? The lights in the night sky. Sky watchers. Sky watchers. We're watching. We're watching. Did you see that? Here. On Engage Life. Hi, this is your host, Deborah Jane East for Skywatchers Radio, uh, watching the skies in North Carolina, and right now we're watching them in Memphis, so I want to say hello to everybody, and I'm all excited this evening because I just came from the 27th Annual UFO Conference in Eureka Springs, and got to hear a lot of wonderful folks talk about what they know best, and that's about extraterrestrial contact. Um, I guess my most exciting moment was getting to meet Nick Pope, who is the former Prime Minister of Defense of Great Britain, and also Linda Mooton Howe was there, and uh, Travis Walton, so a lot of really good speakers. And if you've never been to one of these events, you learn so much, because, you know, myself, I read a lot of things about extraterrestrial contact and UFOs. But I actually went there and learned things I'd never heard of before. So go on out and support these things if they're in your area because these people work hard uh, for disclosure. So it's just really good to be supportive. Well, my guest this evening is Fernando Albert, and he is a medium. And he is a part of the CE5 San Diego team, which you know is one of my favorite uh, CE5 teams because... Peter Chan, Ted Mabbitt, Olga Gorbitz, and Fernando. There are many more members uh, of this team, but I'm just so impressed with all the work they do. And um, I want the world to become familiar with what CE5 is all about. So welcome, Fernando. I would like you to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and also how you got interested in being in a CE5 group. Hi, Deborah. Good afternoon. Well, um, let's see. I'm a medium, as you said. I I am very sensitive to to the different type of energies, whether they are about people or they are uh, on the other side. And I grew up with this gift. I've been aware all of my life about being much more beyond that what we can see than than it's believed to be. And also I've been aware of extraterrestrial life and a lot of uh, energy and intelligence around the universe. So I grew up always very interested on on the topic. I've always been supported by my parents also. So it has been something that I grew up and I got used to it. It has been the recent years that I became more interested and more involved. So I started to do some research online finding minor-like people, finding people with similar gifts and similar interests. And, well, that's how I came up with the CE5. I, I found this group of people that they were doing contact with, with extraterrestrial beings. And, well, it definitely rang my bell. I felt it was something that I should take part of. And that's pretty much how I met the CE5 and how did I get involved with them. And since then, it has been a great experience so far. Well, um, I'll I'll say again, uh, we've talked about this before, but CE5 is Human Initiated Extraterrestrial Contact. So all of these teams all over the world are coming together to have peaceful contact with extraterrestrials. But I'd like to go back just a minute and ask you a little bit, you know, you're talking about your gift. Would you say that you recognized early uh, in your childhood that you had a gift you know, to be a, a medium or or aware of your psychic abilities? When I was a child, I was aware of my psychic abilities, more like being an empath or being able to read the energy of other people or to get, kind of like get information or guidance from higher realms. Not much as a mediumship because I didn't really knew the words, knew the terms. I, I had the gift, my... My dad understood it, understood the gift, but he wasn't involved by then in, in that type of thing, so he supported my awareness, but he never taught me like, oh, yeah, this is mediumship, this is uh, psychic, this is whatever. He he supported me and encouraged me to keep 
still in that connection and that energy, but I I really thought that it was something on the common hood. I really never value it until I started to do some research about six or seven years ago, and and from there is when I became more aware of my abilities and that I could use them to to help people and make a difference while in my life. Well, that's great to hear that your parents were so supportive because a lot of times, you know, children, you know, when things like that happen, the parents sort of, you know, brush it off. But I know the support probably really helped because, you know, having psychic ability, you know, it's not something that you really understand at an early age. But I do think it's important because, you know, talking about extraterrestrials, I've never heard one person say that they had a encounter or an abduction with an extraterrestrial that they spoke with their mouth. It's always telepathic. And uh, so that's why I think that this is so important. And um, have you ever heard of remote viewing, Fernando? Yes, and that's something that I am working on development. Sometimes I can, I am able to do it and I grasp pretty good information, but it's something I always strive for the best and until I don't, well, I don't want to say master because you never really master anything, but until I don't get to a point of more stability in mantaining a successful connection, I wouldn't claim I can do it. But I have instances of remote viewing during the C5 that were validated by other people and could validate a truthful connection. Wow. And for anybody out there that uh, doesn't really know what remote viewing is, could you give us an uh, explanation of that in your terms? Yes, it's something It's something very similar, I would say, to astral projection, which astral projection is pretty much getting out of your body. We all have a soul and we all are having a human experience. I like to say that we are souls in a human body, not the other way around. And so this is something that naturally happens at night, but we can get to the point to master it. Remote viewing is not exactly the same as after projection. Remote viewing is more of expanding, at least from my own experience, expanding your aura and your clairvoyance to a certain point. It's like we are all connected. The energy is like a net. So it's like somehow like you surf the internet with a browser. Then the browser would be kind of like, kind of like your mind's eye. And then you, with remote viewing, you say, I want to connect with this. I want to search that specific person or that specific energy. And then you are taken. You are taken there and it, it downloads images telepathically in your mind's eye. And then you get, sometimes it can be clearer, sometimes it can be more cloudy, but you can you can get a physical description of a play, you can get a physical description of a person, the environment, to a point of higher development, even noises, words, and things going on, and then you do this in a trance state, so you're, even though you're in trance, you can still speak, you can still listen around you, and you can even take some notes of what you are seeing right after the, the session. Well, it's very fascinating to me, and for our viewers out there listening, believe it or not, the U.S. military spent quite a lot of money in the past on remote viewing and had pretty impressive results. And also, um, when I was doing research, I found out that other countries did this as well. So there definitely is something to it if the military wanted to invest that kind of money into researching it. So... Mm-hmm. You know, I tell people, don't shake your head and think it's impossible because things like this, people have been investigating it for quite a while. So, Fernando, when you get ready to plan, um, when Peter and the rest, when y'all plan a CE5 event, do you do any kind of preparation beforehand? Yes, we do. We, We like to do a small meditation, like a group meditation, kind of like to set the intent to receive predictions and 
somehow like to receive an overall feeling of what's going to be the session at night. Then we also like to do some individual meditations so we can raise our vibrations and our energy because all these things are, they have a different frequency of energy. We are in a dense body, so it's a more dense energy while they are in a higher state. So it's like, like air, cool air goes down, warm air goes up. And it's a matter of warming up your own air to be able to communicate with them. So that's another stage we do. We meditate, we set the intention. Doing a group intention is important because then we are all in the same in the same page with a similar vibration. And then since we all have the same state of mind, it kind of like stacks. It's strong. It's like one plus one, it's five, not two. And if it's like all of us at the same time, then it really makes a, a collective consciousness that makes it easier to communicate with them. Then that's the main preparation we do. In addition, we are talking about the topic, like I said, making some predictions. I, I feel it's going to happen. I feel that's going to, to happen. Peter Chan really, really understands and likes numerology. So he does some predictions that way. I get senses towards the energy of what's going to happen or who's going to, to come and visit or pretty much like a preparation and overview of what's going to happen. Then from there, it's, when that's done, pretty much after we, we start the C5, the C5 um, event, we do some premeditations again in a group, some exercises to raise even more our energy following the C5 protocol to communicate with the terrestrial beings. And then pretty much is when we are all set to go, we sit in silent meditation and it's when we start getting connections with them. That is totally fascinating. And like I said again, you know, everybody in your group, uh, very diverse, very dedicated. And y'all meet, uh, is it once a month to do this? Say again, please. Do you do? Does your group meet together once a month or more to do this? Yes, we like to meet once a month. But there are some smaller meetings. Like when we get new members, it's an open group. We welcome people who is mind alike, and sometimes like maybe one day in a week or, or something like that. If we have new people, then we meet with them and we can like train them a little bit, tell them about the C five and we can even do some some practice C5, but the, like the official one, to say it one way, it's once a month. All right, we're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll be back with our guest, Fernando Albert. Looking for a good time? ModernLoveBooks.com The one place to find that special book for that special time. ModernLoveBooks.com Is there anybody out there? The lights in the night sky. Sky watchers. Sky watchers. We're watching. We're watching. Did you see that? Here on EngageLife.fm Something strange was happening in Lilydale, New York. Marina Jacobs went there to search for the one true man that she loved. Too bad he wasn't human. This is Arthur Deborah Jane East. My paranormal romance book, Radiance Love After Death, is available on Amazon worldwide and modernlovebooks.com. True love is not just for the living. When someone asks you what you're doing today, tell them you're living life and having fun on Engage Life Radio. Call in and talk to our hosts about just about anything you can imagine and have a good time doing it. Stay tuned for more fun on Engage Life Radio. And we're back with our guest, Fernando Albert. And I want to ask you this question, Fernando. Does it really bother you when people tell you that extraterrestrials don't exist and they sort of laugh about uh, you know contact does that bother you 
Yeah, that has been one of my bottoms, actually. <laughs> it's funny you have asked that because when I was, even when I was a child, I could be, I could receive the classic insults, you know, that everybody says, but it never bothered me. But when they brought up the topic of extraterrestrials and they said, oh, there can't be any life because there is no oxygen, there is no water, I would get really mad. <laughs> in fact, in, <laughs> in school, I had a perfect academic history, except one day when the biology teacher, and this was when I was like 17, when the biology teacher said why there couldn't be any life in, you know, the planets, and I kind of like fought his thoughts versus mine, and it didn't went end well. <laughs> I got in the tension that day. Oh, well, I can see it's really a sore spot with you, and, and I'll have to say it is with me, too, because there are so many planets out there and other universes that there has to be life. I mean, my my way of thinking is, why shouldn't there be? But uh, I also want you to talk a little bit about being a star seed. And at the conference this weekend, I was uh, very privileged to get to be able to hear Sherry Wild, who wrote a book called Forgotten Promises, and it was about alien abduction and her finding out that she was a star seed, and it was fascinating. Uh, could you explain to everyone about what that is and how you came to that conclusion that you were a star seed? Definitely. First, I will say what it's all about. As you, got, you all know, the universe is always evolving, it's always growing. There are new planets being born. There are new dimensions being created, and there's a constant growth. Right now, the Earth is on the third dimension, and now it's time for the Earth to ascend to a higher dimension because there are younger planets that will take its place. And for one or another reason, the planet needs help. needs help from more ascended beings, but for at least in, for what we know on planet Earth, it's not enough to have etheric beings that are going to help it because unfortunately through religion and through other means it's it, it becomes hard to to help on there. So that's why the star seeds were created to say one word, which is pretty much a extraterrestrial beings who are older souls. They have many, many lifetimes and they, they know, okay, now it's time to help the planet Earth to ascend. And the best way to do it is to work from within, like I say. Um, how? Well, being incarnated as a human being. Uh, being incarnated as a human being, of course, unfortunately, we tend to forget many things, but there are other things that are within ourselves that we do not forget. For an instance, you can know someone is a starship when they are born with fears, when they are born with a phobia. In my case, the, when I was born, like the first or second day, as a baby that I got one of those baths, I got freaked out. And immediately my dad, who is also a starship, knew what was going on. That's what the, that what I was, that what I was saying is what starships are about. It's like they, most of them, if not all, they have different psychic gifts. We all come from, with a purpose here, even if you're not a starship, but usually starships are more in tune with their purpose and they are like, boosting things up to help other human beings who they have always been human to tap into their psychic abilities, into their purpose, and keep the planet going, kind of like igniting the engine for planet Earth to ascend. In my case, I didn't know the term starship since when I was a child, of course, but as I said, I always felt insulted really bad if uh, I was told that extraterrestrials couldn't exist without water and things like that. And then also I grew up, as my dad is fascinated with the same topic, also a star seed. I grew up, you know, watching Star Trek and documentaries about extraterrestrial uh, life and everything, and I always resonated with it. Plus the fact that I always felt like I didn't belong. And it's not a matter of having a hard life, because I had always family around, friends. I was able to do my hobbies. A pretty happy life, I can't complain, but there was always something missing. And I would look into the stars and feel a deep sadness that I couldn't explain. From there, when I started to do some research, as I was saying earlier on the internet, 
I was already working as a psychic in one store, a friend came to me and said, well, you know, I believe that you are a starship. Um, I, I was like, oh, what's that? And then she kind of explained to me and invited me to do some research. So I did, and then it's when many of my answers, many of my questions were answered. I felt a deep connection with with what a starship was about, and it could answer many questions of myself, not being able to belong anywhere, not caring if I live in one or another city, and feeling a profound connection with the stars. And, and that's what helped me to, to really understand I was a starship, and then meeting other starships, we all have the same feeling, the same experiences, and then makes the resonance a lot, a lot stronger. Plus... Well, Fernando, you just really have a great way of explaining things because I can totally understand, you know, about that. It's almost like uh, you feel homesick, you know, for something else, but you can't quite put your finger on it because, to be honest, I have felt like that myself, you know. And, you know, part of the reason why I'm doing this show is because I love to watch the night sky. And... um, so that is that is really you explain that very well. Uh, let's Thank talk you. about some of the successes that uh, the CE five groups have had. Could you explain a little bit about one of your best um, meetings that you had together and what happened and what you saw? Um, yes, definitely. The first one that comes to well, we have been having some successes as far as flashing orbs on the sky. Uh, I'm sure you all know, but if you don't, on the C5, we also have some some apps and some software that will tell us if there is a satellite or something. And we have been able to spot like white orbs on the sky that were no satellite, and of course there were no airplanes or anything, plus some uh, mental connection. I Now it's coming to my mind a very strong... Uh, a strong connection that was validated, that I felt that something was touching me on my back, and then I asked again to be touched, and it happened. And when I brought this up, other members have also felt a similar experience. Or, for an instance, in another successful contact, I would say, we were seeing a bigger group, we were like six or seven, and I had a download with a download, I mean I had like a vision, somehow a short vision about a white electric type of being um, with a feeling. And then other C5 uh, member that was sitting almost opposed to me was able to get the same exact feeling. In the C5, we really validate when two or more uh, persons have the same feeling because then it's proven, it's kind of like a validation that it was not one's imagination or that you thought it is and it isn't. If two or more people have felt the same, then truly there is a, a connection. And, and that was another of our good successes. And then, of course, feeling presences all around us or seeing something flash on the sky, those are good moments that we had contact with them. That's pretty incredible. Uh, is your team able to, um, do y'all do videotape or pictures or anything like that? Not at this moment. That's something we, we have planned to, but we want to increase the energy and to increase the, the communication with them first. I believe that some pictures have been taken. I'm not uh, 100% aware, but that's something planned for the future. Oh, that's great. And I don't know, I think I did send you a pictures of the two uh, geodes, the stones that I was holding when I was doing one of the first interviews with your team. And uh, when I showed the pictures to uh, Peter, he seemed to connect, you know, with both of them. Uh, what do you think of that? Do you? I mean, it was a weird thing. I knew I had to hold those stones and then afterwards to take a picture, and I didn't know why. Could could extraterrestrials really contact in these ways, you know, like by those images on the stone 
and you know you've just described feeling a touch you know it's not just it's not just seeing things in the sky is it no definitely i and i believe through gemstones of all kinds they can communicate i i believe that everything pretty much has a consciousness and especially crystals they can be very powerful that's the reason why we can feel drawn to a crystal say oh i really like it i have to to have it or i want to to buy this or maybe you see the crystal and you don't care for it even if it's the most beautiful thing you don't care for it because there is a more profound connection and well definitely i i do believe that the terrestrial links can manipulate matter to to communicate uh, to us in fact this might go a little too beyond the topic we are we are on but it is said through channeling and through people that has remember things from past lives that in times of Atlantis they were able to communicate with extraterrestrial beings through crystals and then there is all these crystal schools that still exist nowadays that it seems that they were devices to communicate with beings from Orion so definitely I do believe that they can communicate through us, not only they can but they do already if you are all open to that That's really incredible what, what kind of message, what do you feel like the message of extraterrestrial contact is, Fernando? What do you think they're trying to say to us? What is their message? First of all, I believe it's a message about disclosure, about kind of like it's time for you, Earthlings, to be connected to the higher net, to say it one way, to be connected to a higher consciousness and to a higher awareness, kind of like it's time to evolve. Come on already. But of course, in a way of love and and compassion. Since, unfortunately for one or another reason, not everybody is open and, well, um, it's not as easy as landing in a ship and saying, hi, we are here to help you. Then they, that's why the youth starts it and that's why the awareness is slowly coming up and I believe that more and that day, day after day they are more and more starseed and even on some higher position that are are starting to bring awareness and starting to bring messages of love and messages of bliss. I I do believe that in higher uh, realms of existence there is no negativity. So anything that is negative does not even exist, and they want heirs to experience that, which means no pain, no worries, no sadness, no nothing, not even no. <laughs> Only yes, wow. please. That's what they want. Well, to you know, what? I've heard I've heard this said before, and I think it's a universal message that they do want to come in peace and they want the best for us. So I do hope that you will continue with your team and keep on doing what you're doing. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And could you share how everyone could get in contact with the CE5 team? And also, uh, you have a personal website. Could you give us those links? Yes. My personal website is Fernando Albert, like my name, medium.com. Again, it's Fernando Albert, medium.com. And medium would be like fake medium. That's the way to, to find my website and to contact the C five we you can send me an email if you if you like. You can either use the contact me tool on my website or you can send me an email to Fernando at Fernando Albert Medium dot com. And also uh, there is a Facebook group, it's C five San Diego, and you can also look that up and you can be in contact with, with us that way. Well, it has been a pleasure speaking with you, and we are out of time. We're on the road, and our battery is, is going to go dead here shortly. So uh, I just want to say that it's been a, a delight to get to know the team, and I look forward to further expeditions. And please feel uh, free to share anything on our Skywatchers Radio Facebook page. And uh, I wish you all the best, and I hope to talk to you all again. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to Skywatchers Radio. We're broadcasting live from Memphis and look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you so much, Albert. You have a great evening. 
Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye. The Sky Watchers with Deborah Jane East. Contact us, skywatchersfacebook.com or Alien Chronicles for more information.